had a have you ever had a flying dream? Well, as a kid, I had them all the time, and I was obsessed with making them reality. No matter what anyone said about a little thing called gravity, I literally spent my childhood jumping off chairs, flapping my arms. 20 years later, I found myself working for an entertainment company in Florida, as one does. You wouldn't have recognized me because I had to wear this hideous, neon, psychedelic, full-body unitard that looks like a box of Skittles vomited all over me with a matching comb hat. And I had to prance around on stage, a once seven time national champion, looking like the rainbow bright unicorn as background eye candy for this aerial act. Now, while watching the aerial act, none of this spandex nonsense mattered because all that I could think about was how badly I wanted to be up there flying. One day my boss called and he asked Christine, would you be willing to learn three basic aerial tricks for our upcoming show? I was in my car on my way to his office before he hung up the phone. And every Thursday from then on, I'd spend four hours driving from Orlando to Miami, where I spent the remainder of each week training with an old acrobatic teammate of mine who had just retired from Cirque du Soleil. I swear, this guy looked like an upside down triangle. Beefy pectoral muscles, itty bitty little pencil waist, jet black flowing hair. Kind of what you get when you cross Fabio with the Dorito. So I nicknamed him Fabio and I will never forget my first aerial training experience with Fabio. We train in this oven of a warehouse filled with musty circus costumes on the cordelis, which is a canvas rope that hangs 32 feet from the ceiling. That's three stories, by the way. Now, it might look like your typical high school PE rope, but imagine flipping and dangling by one ankle on a rope. And you might imagine it hurts like hell. So I start learning the cordelis by climbing one pole up the rope at a time, inch by inch, like a caterpillar. And the first time that I managed to climb all the way to the top, so high I can touch a warehouse ceiling. I'm so excited, I feel like I've won the Olympic gold medal. And I start to descend, but Fabio says, wait, stay up there for one minute. That minute drags on like a slug. And by the time I hear him say, 56, 57, 58, 59, one minute, I slide down the rope like a fireman's pole, tearing all the skin off my palms. Horrified, I think, well, no, there's no more aerial for me. Only two minutes later, Fabio says, up again. And I say, excuse me, but did you actually see my hand? And he says, yeah, I did. I'm sorry, Christine, but it's the only way to build up enough strength. So I kid you not, I bandage my hands in toilet paper and duct tape, <laughs> and I climb that rope. And two hours later, my hands looked like claws, my forearms were swollen like Popeyes, and I got to my hotel room caked in dirt, sweat, and blood. And I lay down in the bed, and I was too tired to even cry. The only thing that had energy were my thoughts. But they were being so mean to me. I can't do this, this is way too hard, it's too painful, I'm too old, I'm not strong enough. Imagine doing pull-ups for six to eight minutes straight, which is basically the entire length of the Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody song, and you'll get an idea of what it's like to do an aerial act. I doubted I had that in me. So my last thought was, I'm not good enough. By a show of hands, wherever you are, even if you're alone in your own room, how many of you have ever avoided applying for a job? or asking that special someone out for dinner, or asking for a raise, or speaking in public, or anything at all because you thought you weren't good enough. If you didn't raise your hand, I presume you don't speak English. <laughs> because the problem is that 85% of the population, that is four out of every five of us, according to research by Dr. Joe Rubino and other studies, lack self-esteem. The biggest obstacle to your success 
in business, finance, relationships, personal goals, isn't talent or education or money or connections. It's believing in yourself. Believing in yourself is the foundation for every action you will take, every goal you will achieve, and every ounce of potential that you will fulfill. But how do you believe in yourself when you don't? That is the challenge that I was struggling with that evening in my hotel room when every cell in my body was aching and every thought was telling me, you're not good enough. Both inside and out, I was suffering. I felt more defeated than I had ever felt before. I want you to notice in your own life the moments when you feel uncomfortable. And all of those feelings associated with discomfort, stress, rejection, fear, pain, anger, as a crossroad. Because discomfort is a dream killer. Discomfort can kill your dreams. The moment you quit in order to feel better is the moment your dream may die. The moment you quit in order to feel better is the moment your dream may die. I laid there for a long time feeling sorry for myself, broken, and frankly, done. Then I got up and I packed my bags and I was on my way out the door to quit. But just before I left, I looked at myself in the face in the mirror and I asked, what do you want? What do you really, really want? And I heard this little voice in my mind say, I want to fly. And I thought of something Toni Morrison wrote. She wrote, if you want to fly, you have to give up the shit that brings you down. And I knew in that moment exactly what I had to give up. I had to give up being comfortable for a while. I'm sharing this story with you because if you want a bigger, better life, you're going to have to make space for discomfort. That is the first step. So what if, just what if, instead of judging discomfort as the enemy, you were to accept and embrace it as part of the journey? What if you trained yourself to associate the discomfort of your challenges with the outcome of success? I mean, hell, standing here before all of you and the technology and all of it makes me want to run out that door. But I am training myself to associate this wildly uncomfortable feeling with the outcome of success. What if you were to allow yourself, all of your feelings of unworthiness and depression and discomfort and fear and anger, and instead of seeing them as proof of your weakness, you were to view them as opportunities to exercise your courage on the way to your success. How powerful would you be then? In my hotel room that evening, I learned my lesson. Instead of running from discomfort, I chose my dream instead. Step two, break your dreams down into their simplest components. Around that same time, I left a seven year marriage I told him to keep everything and I walked away with a suitcase of clothes and I threw all the clothes out. I moved from Orlando to Hollywood, California where I got a job teaching aerobics and I rented a small unfurnished studio apartment and I slept on a broken air mattress. Basically, the only thing I had to my name besides a broken air mattress was this dream of becoming a professional aerialist. But all that I could do up until that time were the three basic tricks I'd learned for a show that was now over. I didn't have a coach. There weren't any aerial studios or circus schools anywhere near me, and those that were far away were for children. Now, at age 28, that didn't help me. YouTube wasn't a thing yet, and there were no aerial artistry for dummies books. Believe me, I checked. <laughs> so I had to become my own guinea pig. Well, because I didn't know the correct way to do the aerial wraps, I got tangled in a lot of knots. And because I didn't know the proper athletic clothing to wear, I have many second degree aerial rope and fabric burns. 
And because I didn't know that even though one of the aerial acts I was learning is called aerial silks, but you don't actually train on real silk fabric. Well, who knew? Go figure. So I caught the back of my pant leg on fire doing a slack drop on real silk. So I really had to learn everything through trial and error. You know, most people don't dream big enough. You know when you dream big enough, when your dream seems impossible. But have you ever dreamed an impossible sounding dream and then felt overwhelmed at the magnitude of how to achieve it? I wanted to be an aerialist more than I wanted anything in the world but I didn't feel like an aerialist. I felt like a phony. Have you ever felt like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here. I don't have the skills, the ability, the education, the qualifications, the experience other people think I have. I'm a phony, I'm a fraud, I'm, a, I'm, not, a good, I'm not good enough. Well, I learned later that this is called imposter syndrome. Now, imposter syndrome isn't a real syndrome, nor is it a mental disorder. But it is a real psychological experience that up to 70% of people in the world suffer from, most without even being aware of it. Men, women, children from all walks of life, different backgrounds, ethnicities, those of you with alcoholic or abusive parents, as well as those of you with perfect ideal childhoods. There's no immunity and there's no vaccine. It can hit you any time, any place as a CEO, as a parent, as a student, as an athlete, or as I learned, as a fledgling aerialist. I frankly had no idea how to become a professional aerialist. So I was suffering pretty badly from imposter syndrome. Now, if you are an imposter, like I am, you'll be happy to know that you are in good company. Most talented, educated, competent people suffer from imposter syndrome. Meryl Streep, Albert Einstein, Maya Angelou. I have taught world champions and Olympians and celebrities and no amount of success or medals prevents one from su suffering from doubt and thoughts of inadequacy. To some extent, we're all winging it. You're not alone. In fact, it is the highest achievers, the ones who are pushing their areas of expertise who are most likely to suffer from imposter syndrome, which is what was happening to me, which made believing in my dream tough and believing in self-doubt easy. So I came up with a plan. I thought, if I can't get myself to believe this whole ambitious dream of becoming a professional aerialist, what if I reprogram my thinking and I just break that dream down into its basic components into little steps and I get myself to believe in the next step towards that dream? I mean, that I can do. That you can do. So I took my dream and I broke it down into its basic components. I mean, I knew I needed to learn some tricks. I needed to get a costume, I needed a video, I needed to book some shows. And then I took those components and I broke them down into little baby mini steps. So I didn't have to believe that I could become an aerialist. I just had to find a place to train. And I didn't have to believe I could become an aerialist. I just had to buy two yards of costume fabric. And I didn't have to believe I could become an aerialist. I just had to climb that next climb up the rope. That I could believe in. And no, it wasn't easy. I mean, it's painful climbing on shredded hands. It's scary climbing 30 feet on shredded hands. But when my wounds reopened, I rebandaged them and I ignored the pain. And when I felt afraid, I would remember something that my old acrobatic coach Yorick used to say when I was a kid in acro gymnastics. He'd say, Kristinka. Don't worry, if you fall, the ground will catch you. <laughs> By continuing to break my dream down into its simplest components and believing in the next step, I created a momentum of confidence through incremental wins. My hands healed over, grew a protective layer of callus. My body changed shape, 
I dropped five dress sizes and grew some muscles. The climbing got easier and tricks that felt like torture during my first class started to feel like second nature. And by continuing to take one step after, after the next, I gained enough confidence to spend $6,000, which was basically the bulk of my savings, to create the best video promo that I could manage. And then I quit my job teaching aerobics and I spent my days marketing that video to one agency after the next entertainment agency after the next. I must have sent out over 300 video promos. I got back one call back, one. And she asked me to do one corporate show in Las Vegas, one. And I was thrilled because all I needed was one opportunity to prove myself. So I told her, let me check my schedule. <laughs> I arrived at that venue as the consummate professional, as if I had done that show a thousand times before. I came early, I asked, what can I do to make your job easier? And although I was shaking in my leotard, I was so nervous. I did an aerial act that I was proud of. And that one opportunity triggered a series of referrals that launched my career. And ever since that day, over 20 years ago, I have been traveling the world performing out of, at over 50 countries as a professional aerialist. By taking and believing in one step after the next, I climbed out of a life in which I did not belong and into one that I love with all my heart. My point is this. It doesn't matter whether you're climbing a circus rope or a corporate ladder. The rules are the same. We don't learn to believe in ourselves by taking grand leaps but by taking one step after the next. Step three, create your own launch team. I am co-owner of an aerial retreat center in Costa Rica that teaches flying trapeze. And on a daily basis, first time flyers climb up this metal ladder, it's 22 feet high, which is the height of a flagpole. And they step on this small little wooden platform. And it's funny because you'll see some of the badass, the most badass men and women in the world shaking like a wet chihuahua up there, terrified of taking their first leap into the abyss. Many of them are convinced that they are not going to make it through this experience until the boards worker beside them tells them, you've got this. I know you can do this. I believe in you. And he or she holds their faith just for a moment. Suddenly, they are flying. It is magnificent to see these students come out of the net fully transformed thinking, oh my God, if I can do that, what else am I capable of? If I can do that, what else am I capable of? These are words that move us and transform us. And I've seen students ask those words and then leave abusive relationships and quit jobs that they hated and start businesses that they loved because once you learn to fully believe in yourself, anything becomes possible. Years ago, my good friend Yevgeny Marchenko, who looks more like a basketball player than a gymnast, he's a gentle giant, he's six foot four, was training in an intense master of sport training program in Riga, Latvia, which was the former Soviet Union. Now, he was required to take a high level conditioning test that would determine whether he would pass or fail out of the program. <clears throat> well, Yevgeny loves acrobatic gymnastics as much as I do, so he spent months training for this test. He failed. His coach said, you're not strong enough. Thing is, I see something in your eyes. You go back, try again. Yevgeny went back and he trained even harder. He came to the gym early and he left late. He took the tester again, he failed it again. His coach said, the rules say you failed. You're not good enough. Thing is, I still see something in your eyes. I'm giving you one last chance. Yevgeny returned and he trained as if his life depended on it. And the third time around when the test came and he took it and he passed it. He saw that his coach had been right about him. 
Yevgeny Marchenko went on to become a five-time world champion. He's, he's one of my greatest heroes. And eventually, after my father, Don Van Lu, helped him and his family move to America, Yevgeny Marchenko went on to coach Carly Patterson win the all-around 2004 Olympic gold medal in gymnastics. Yevgeny Marchenko was not good enough. Until he was. Thing is, we cannot possibly identify with feeling good enough. Because no one is until the moment that they are. This is the natural route to achievement. Confusion always precedes enlightenment. There's darkness before the dawn. Acrobatic gymnastics taught me that in order to succeed, I had to fully commit to doing that thing or not to do it at all. Basically, the message I always got was, you go big or you go home. Because imagine half-heartedly doing a standing backflip. <laughs> I've seen it. You fall on your head. There is no safe half-hearted way to do a standing backflip or to become a great aerialist or to become great at anything. You have to fully commit by exercising that muscle of believing in yourself. That is easier said than done though, I get that. Because the reason that Yevgeny's story moved me so much was that it reminded me so much of my own story. Even though I'm a seven time national champion, I actually started as that worst student in the class with zero talent. I was the last student to learn every skill and then move up in levels. My coach Eric used to say, there are children in the world with talent. And then there is Krasinka. So how did I go from there, from being the world's biggest athletic, not good enough student to here, a female Olympic athlete of the year, athlete of the decade, and legend in my sport? Well, I'll tell you, the single biggest factor in my success as an elite athlete, and as an aerialist, and as a human being, has never been nutrition or supplements or even how hard I train or talent. It has always been, do I believe in myself? Am I capable and worthy of my dreams? Am I good enough? The moments that I could conjure a yes, strength would pour into my body where there was none a moment before. But the second I let doubt infiltrate my mind, that strength would just drain right out. We are battling a constant mental tug of war, all of us, that is made easier by creating a launch stream to pull for us on our side. Self-belief is a lonely place. And during the inevitable times, you're gonna feel not good enough. You're gonna need someone a coach, a friend, a mentor, a loved one, but someone who believes in you more than you believe in yourself to stand by your side and help you to push your success from here to there. Yevgeny was lucky because he had a coach who believed in him more than he believed in himself and despite evidence that showed that Yevgeny wasn't good enough and for, for him that made all the difference. I was fortunate because whenever I came home as a kid feeling not good enough, and believe me, there were plenty of those days. I had loving parents who reminded me that I mattered. Now that might not sound significant, but believing that you matter is the foundation for going into the world and experiencing it the way that you deserve to experience it. Now, whether you were raised with a coach who believed in you or parents who told you that you mattered, doesn't matter because now, you have the power to create those launch teams yourself. Now, that might require asking for help. For example, not so long ago, well, let me tell you, I'm writing a book called Falling to the Top, and I don't feel very confident when it comes to the editing part. So I posted on Facebook a message saying, would anybody, any of my friends, be willing to help me with the editing part of this? Well, guess what? 22 people stepped in and said, I'd be happy to help you. Now, I've also contacted perfect strangers. I've con I once called 10 keynote speakers and I 
told them, would you be willing to, to either spend five to 10 minutes with me by phone, or I'd be happy to take you out for lunch or coffee, just so I could pick your brain on marketing myself as a speaker. Well, out of that, those 10 people, two of them were exceptionally gracious with their time, and I learned a lot from them. But the best um, launch team that I found that one, I would have to say probably the most uh, helpful has been creating a mastermind group. Now, a mastermind group is basically a group of diverse individuals that regularly meet together to help each other with their goals and also to, to support one another and encourage one another. The first mastermind group I ever made was in Los Angeles and we would meet on Friday evenings at six o'clock at Aroma Cafe in North Hollywood. And I remember the first meeting and the first time it was my turn to speak. I remember thinking, well, here goes nothing. And I told the group, I really, really want to be a professional aerialist. But in order to be a professional aerialist, I really need a professional video promo and I need a website. The problem is I'm broke and I don't know how to do these things. And then I just got silent. One other guy at the table was a computer software engineer and he said, that's easy. I can spend two weekends with you and I'll teach you how to do those things yourself. And he did. And I in turn helped him to get in shape. So it was a great, you know, exchange. Um, we are the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. Um, so I want you to look around and I want you to ask yourself, what kind of people do I hang out with? Who are, the pe who are these people? Are they people who lift me up or who drag me down? Are they people who inspire me or who demoralize me? Because I don't need to remind you that you're going to be around the doubters and the haters and even the people who love you, who think that they're doing you a favor by breaking your dream down into its, to a smaller dream because they don't believe. Drown those voices out. Instead, create your own launch team of people who inspire you, who lift you up, who challenge you, who love you, who believe in you, turn those voices up. Make those voices the loudest voices in your head. The word confidence comes from the Latin con fide, meaning with faith. Sometimes it takes finding someone to hold our faith until we are ready to hold it ourselves. Expect your dreams to make you prove yourself to them. Big dreams aren't just gonna fall in your lap. You are gonna get tangled up and you're gonna get your own version of rope burn and you're gonna feel not good enough. In fact, can, can in fact you, you need to expect to, to feel not good enough because that's what it takes to get to your success. But continuing on despite that feeling is the measure of how badly you are willing to fight for your dreams. The good news is that confidence is learnable, and as you learn, that crucial belief takes root and spreads into all parts of your life. So I want you to remember these three points. Step number one, make space for discomfort. Instead, learn to thrive within the inevitable discomfort of feeling not good enough. Step two. Break your dreams down into their simplest components. And no, because I'm telling you, you don't have to believe you can climb all the way to the top today. You just have to believe with all of your heart that you can take the next step. And three, build your own launch team of people who lift you up and who will stand by your side until you are ready to hold your faith, until you hold it yourself. And then go out and, and take it, do experiment, ex, ex, excuse me, <laughs> take chances on things until you find something that makes you feel like, oh my God, if I can do that, what else am I capable of? By believing in myself, every single extraordinary experience since that moment became possible. I want to leave you with one last little memory of Paul McCartney rehearsing this gigantic stadium all of these songs I'd heard since I was in my mother's womb. I was opening for him that evening before 100,000 people, solo by myself, as a professional aerialist. 
Suddenly, Paul stopped his rehearsal, and he pointed directly at me and said, Hey, you, Christine, watch this. Then he proceeded to kick into a handstand, fall over, and burst out laughing. This man, who has reached the pinnacle of success in the world, was trying to connect with me in the things that I love. I got to experience that because I chose to believe. Put everything at risk and become your greater self. Thank you.